Good morning or good afternoon, good evening to everybody and welcome to the second day of the 2021 annual seminar of the PhD program in Contemporary Humanism. Um, the title of the seminary this year, as you already know, is uh, Fraternity, Social Friendship During the Time of Social Distancing. Today's speaker is Professor uh, Matteo Rizzoli. We have a small change in the program today. Uh, Professor Bruni, for health reasons, cannot uh, speak today. And Professor Rizzoli has accepted our invitation to take over from Professor Bruni. Professor Matteo Rizzoli is Professor, Associate Professor of Economic Policy at Lumsa University and the coordinator of the European Master of Law and Economics. Professor Rizzoli has broadly published in um, topics related to, uh, to economics and uh, many different <laughs> things. Um, the title of Professor uh, Matteo Rizzoli is COVID-19 and Social Preferences. Many thanks, Matteo, for accepting our, our invitation and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan, and thank you, everybody, for inviting me. I know I'm not um, um, uh, up to the task of substituting uh, Professor um, Bruni, at least on the topics he was supposed to speak of, uh, so the connection between the Bible and economics. That's not exactly my field, but I hope you will find any way interesting and relevant for your work the things that I'm going to tell you about. So I'm an economist. I do um, work in um, experimental economics, law and economics as well. Uh, so today what I want to do is to share with you some of the uh, things we do um, in, in our uh, field uh, that casts uh, interesting light on the topics on the topic that you are discussing. So specifically, what, how, what do we mean uh, as economists by fraternity and how do we study how uh, fraternity or social preferences, as we call them, we call it, uh, um, changed uh, during the COVID-19. But before doing that, I want uh, to play a game with you. So, uh, as I told you, I'm an experimentalist, so I use experiments both for doing research but also for teaching purposes. And uh, so I want you to all take up your phones. So take your smartphones in your hand, please. Take your smartphones and uh, uh, point with your Welcome to the QR code that you see on the screen. If uh, nothing happens, you can manually go to the website, which is uh, classx.uni. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna change screen. So I'm coming back to the QR code, okay, in a, in a while. But just for those of you who cannot use that, I'm gonna post the link also on the chat of Meet. All right, so you have the link there too, but let's go back to the QR code. So you just have to point the camera to the QR code, uh, a link will open in your browser, and there wait for me to come with my account and start the game. Yes, you can do it here. No, no, quicker. Ah, okay, okay. All right, so let's see how many of you have managed to log in. So I see only six of you, 13 actually. Okay, so already a good number. So we are two, four, six, eight. Yeah, we are almost there because we are 11, 12 here in class, plus people from home. 
So whoever has problems from home, please, you, you can play this game from home too, right? Okay, so no problem. So for those of you who are following remotely, no problem. Just uh, go on the, that's the beauty of running experiments on smartphones. You can play them everywhere. So I'm saying that for, uh, for Laura in particular, that I know she likes playing. Well, she was, has been very curious about what I was doing with experiments, so now Laura can know more about it. Okay, so let's see how many of you have managed to log in. Uh, oh, still 13. So I, I let a few seconds more. You can, you can also use the link that is on the chat, okay? So on the, on the chat of uh, Google Meet, uh, there is a link. If you follow that link, you can play the same game. Yes, also people on YouTube. So th for those of, of you who are following on YouTube, you can play the game too. Same uh, thing. Uh, maybe in your case uh, here, you, uh, you didn't see the link on the Google Classroom chat, but you see it here. So this is classx.uni uh, um, score passau.de is the link. All right, so 13. No more? No more. All right, okay, so let's start the game. So here I read the brief instructions. So here, sorry, just, so here in class, are we all, is there anybody with a problem logging into the game? Did you all manage? Yes. Yes, no, okay. So uh, if, if you, okay, so if you follow the link, uh, then you have to manually, okay, you have to manually choose Lumsa University. So with the QR code, you were ju just uh, directly uh, into the game. But if you follow the link, then you have to choose the Lumsa University, choose Rizzoli, choose participant, and then you, you are asked for a password, which is Rizzoli, pay attention to the small capital letters. Yeah, it's under the Italian, uh, so, so there's a list of Italian universities divided by country. You have to look for Italian universities, then there is uh, Lumsa. Yes, Rizzoli, and then uh, participant, and then Rizzoli again. All right. It's only all small, double Z, double L. Good? Good. So let's see if I see you here. Oh yeah, 14. All right, so I read the instructions. So normally in an, in a, in an economic class or in our experiments, I would offer real incentive. Oh, Fabio is uh, here too, so we should give uh, instructions to Fabio as well. So Fabio, we are playing uh, an experiment, and uh, if you quickly point your smartphone to this QR code. Ah, okay, good. All right, so normally we would offer uh, real incentives, real economic incentives to play games, and that's what I would do in my class, but I know that that would um, undermine your already low uh, esteem of uh, economists as teachers, so no, no economic incentives here, okay? But play the game as it would be real. So you play, so these are the instructions. You play with another participant here in the group, so not necessarily here in the room, you can be coupled with somebody else on YouTube or uh, uh, somewhere else. So, so, but with somebody who is playing the game with us. 
uh, red, the red player decides how to divide 10 euros between the red player and the green player. Then the green player can decide to accept or reject the proposal. Okay, after the division, the, the green player knows how much he is given or she is given, and then can decide whether to accept or reject. If the green player rejects the proposal, both participants get nothing. Okay? Simple instructions. Any question on the instructions? No? No doubt? All right, so we can play the, this game. So some of you will be uh, red players, so you will have to take the decisions and then the green players will have to decide whether they will accept or not. So I still see that two red players must take the decision, one, one left. One red player must take the decision. I know it's, uh, it's hard. I know it raises a lot of uh, very puzzling and uh, excruciating uh, questions, moral questions, but in order for the lesson to go on, we really shall take this decision. All right, good. So two more Green players must, must now take the decision whether to accept or reject the offer. One left. Come on. I know that it's also a tough question to decide whether to accept or reject, but let's do it now so we can move on. I, I, I give you 10 seconds. There is one player who must still take the decision. Yeah, is, is that you? What? You probably have to to take the decision and then uh, uh, there is like a bottom at, uh, try to refresh the page. No, if you have already taken the decision then no, no it's the same. All right, let's try last time to refresh and then we move on. Good, all right, I see that. Okay, so let's see the results. So here is the, here is the results. So five, uh, sorry, how many people? 75% uh, of the people have offered five euros, okay? Have offered five euros and uh, all, of, all of these offers have been accepted. Okay, so all their equally shared uh, divisions proposed by the red players were accepted by the, the, the player, the green player. Then there was 25%, uh, so around, I think, uh, it could be one or two persons, I believe, because we were like six players. Yeah, I think one, one, one or two persons actually uh, decided to offer only three, okay? So to keep seven for themselves, and they were uh, rejected, okay? This offer was rejected. All right, so this, this is the result of this game we played in class. I wanted you to, to play it uh, for real because on this game, do you know the name of this game? Have you ever played uh, 
Have you ever played games uh, or experiments in a, no? All right, so, th so this is a quite famous game called the Ultimatum Game, and uh, social scientists, including econo economists, have, but lately also uh, philosophers, there is a growing branch called um, experimental philosophy that uses this kind of games, uh, uh, learned uh, a lot, L we learned a lot from uh, studying uh, the data coming from this very simple game and a lot of variations of this game. So, um, so as you know, eco uh, economics had since uh, its beginning, so since uh, the time of Adam Smith and Antonio Genovesi, uh, a very poor understanding of human behavior, uh, very poor in the sense that it was formally very elegant. Uh, um, uh, it, it allowed economists to build mathematical models of human behavior, which offered powerful predictions, but it was uh, quite poor in, in understanding uh, and capturing the complexity of human behavior. And we came to know that model as the model of homo economicus, okay? Sorry, here it should be o economic. Homo, yes, th these are, sorry, these are the automatic correction. Uh, I, 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 I assure you that I wrote O economicus in Latin before it was <laughs> changed. Uh, so, Homo economicus, uh, uh, but I mean, uh, since the 70s, that model, um, uh, even economists came to be very dissatisfied with the predictions of that model, and since the 70s, especially with the uh, introduction of the experimental methods and the empirical uh, uh, development of empirical methods in economics, we started to enlarge our picture to capture more complex uh, um, aspects of, uh, uh, of, of human behavior. So uh, economists uh, since then have studied things that are at least economists at, at that time considered to be quite far away from the realm of economics, but nowadays, no, not any longer. So economists normally nowadays study things such intentions, moral obligations, altruism or spite, reciprocity, and uh, aversion to inequality. These, these and others, uh, this is just a, a partial list of what economists came to um, call uh, social preferences, okay? So, um, so these are um, a number, but not an exhausting list of what we call uh, social preferences. And uh, we study those uh, mainly by collecting empirical evidence through experiments and by, so, so basically the work uh, of an experimentalist is basically done by having a, a model of behavior. Typically, you start, we started in the 70s with the Homo economicus, which makes predictions. For instance, let's, let's see what is the, the, the standard uh, um, orthodox prediction of behavior in the ultimatum game. Okay, so let's, uh, let's make this um, as a paradigmatic study that you would see in experimental economics. Well, in the ultimatum game, an economist of the 70s would argue that, well, there is, a, of course, the red player, sorry, yes, the red player has an advantage because he is the first mover. So he can make any offer, right? And, and any offer above zero is better than zero for the green player. So why should a green player reject any low offer? There, there is no point. 0 0.1 is better than zero. So it would be rational for a green player accepting any offer as low as, as, as it is, it's better than zero. And anticipating this, uh, a rational red player should make the highest, sorry, the smallest possible offer. So this is the prediction you get from the theory, and you can study it empirically by running experiments such as the ultimatum game and others. And that, that's how econ economics has uh, basically developed uh, the present understanding we have of social preferences. Well, 
it turns out to, that, that in fact, none, no player actually behaves in the ultimatum game as, uh, uh, as the predictions of uh, uh, economics. But I, I will come back to the um, standard results of the uh, ultimatum game later. But first, I want to uh, tell you some, something more about the relation between what we understand as social preferences and, uh, and the, the, the topic of fraternity. So what is fraternity for an economist? Well, fraternity is very seldom cited as such in economics, okay? There is, uh, with, with some exceptions, of course, there is, for instance, one very good publication by Bruni and Sagden, uh, which is uh, a major uh, English economist of these days, which has exactly fraternity in the title, but this is really one of the few exceptions. Uh, uh, we, uh, so here you get a, um, so w one related concept, however, to fraternity is the one of reciprocity. And reciprocity is, uh, is a far more common uh, uh, topic uh, uh, that you find in the economic literature. So what is the, the link I see, we see uh, between fraternity and reciprocity. I take this from, from the dictionary of um, uh, civil economy. So in contrast with solidarity, which is impersonal and refers to an abstract community based on identity, fraternity is interpersonal and emphasizes the diversity between, between equals based on differentiation. As such, it depends on the principle of reciprocity linked to mutual obligations, okay? So reciprocity, so the, the, the behavior, the strategic behavior, so I, I mean, why do I use this word strategic? Well, in economics, strategic is, is everything that happens, or at least in order to be strategic, it must happen uh, also on a time dimension. And I behave strategically if I think about the consequences of my behavior on the behavior of the others and how this, the behavior of the others might reflect on turn on my behavior. So what is reciprocity? Reciprocity is, that, that can be either positive or negative, is to respond to others' behavior in kind. So be nice with people that are nice to me and be nasty, evil with people that are evil to me, okay? So, one possible approach to, um, to, to, yeah, to games like the, uh, like the ultimatum game or other forms of repeated games is to reciprocate. And fraternity has much to do with uh, reciprocity, or at least this is uh, uh, one of the aspects of uh, fraternity. There is another aspect which I see and are, is very relevant um, uh, of the concept of fraternity, which is at least can be understood in terms of social preferences, and it is the one of inequity aversion. And here, to show you the link between fraternity and inequity aversion, I refer to, I refer to, to the words of uh, uh, John Rawls, and in his famous uh, book, he makes an explicit reference to fraternity uh, when he says that the, the difference principle, so the maximum principle, however, does seem to correspond to a natural meaning of fraternity. So the maximum principle is for him is neither solidarity nor liberty. Okay, so he, he, in, the, in the paragraphs before, he was arguing what, what what, how sh you should understand the maximum principle. And he, he says, well, the maximum principle is, uh, is probably closer to the, the concept of fraternity. Namely, to the idea of not wanting to have greater advantages unless this is to the benefits of others who are less well off. And this is how you expect people to behave within a family concept. So when within a, con um, a um, sorry, um, a context, where you have fraternal relations with the other members of your group. All right, so fraternity is both captured by these two social preferences. Reciprocate the behavior of others, be kind with people that are kind to you, 
and also to struggle for the poorest or to struggle for those of your group who are in the worst position. And uh, both these social preferences are at play when you play the ultimatum game. So the ultimatum game has been, so let me say this about the ultimatum. The ultimatum game is one of the oldest workhorses of experimental economics. The first paper discussing the ultimatum game is from the early 80s. And since then, there have been thousands of uh, replications of the experiment, extensions in any direction, and so on and so forth. And uh, so you saw it's very simple. It's literally two lines of instructions, okay? Being so simple, it produces, well, it, it is a very simple game, but understanding what happens in the ultimatum game, it's very complex, and in fact, economists and social scientists have been studying the ultimatum game for 40 years now. Because what happens there, it, uh, how people behave in that game is, is really complex. And two of the things that are at play in understanding the behavior are exactly this. So reciprocity, so you decide to reject a very low offer because you you think that that person was unkind to you, okay? So reciprocity is really a component in understanding why people reject uh, low offers. And also, of course, in equity aversion, okay? So people, and the evidence we have uh, after all these thousands of replications of this game is that, is, is, is this one, okay? So, so, and so now let's confront what happened here in class with the evidence coming from these uh, 40 years of studies of the ultimatum game. Well, typically, everywhere you go, you find that people, people offer uh, between 40 and 50% of the pie. This is at least the average offer for the accepted offers, okay? So those offers that are accepted are usually, so the modal uh, offer is 50, somebody offers a little bit less than that. So between 40 and 50 typically meets with an acceptance of the counterpart. Below 40, it's very easy to, uh, to get rejected. And the, the, the interesting thing is that people, people perfectly anticipate this. So the, the rate of rejections is very low because you see very few low offers, okay? So here in class, to see that 25% actually offered low, well, relatively low, because three is not that low, okay? So for, for the low offer, I would say like one. So the, remember that the prediction, the prediction of the theory would be to offer one or 0 0.1 if it is possible to offer decimals, okay? So three, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure whether three is a, is a low offer, certainly it's lower than five, but is much higher than one. And it was rejected, by the way. So, um, so uh, typically offers below this range are rejected. And uh, uh, in this column that you see on my uh, right, you see that this, so this is a, a meta study conducted in 2004. So now it's, it's almost 20 years old. So I, I don't know how many more studies there have been since then. But you see here, this, this game has been played all over the, the world, and especially, you see that there have been a, a beautiful study in the um, uh, late 90s. So an anthropologist that by now has become very famous, he was a young uh, PhD student, uh, Joseph Enlick, uh, went to 15 most case societies. So he was an anthropologist traveling to Papua Nova Guinea um, the Amazon forest, uh, and to, to, to look for the Homo economicus. Actually, the paper is called In Search for the Homo economicus. So they were looking for societies that, I mean, the, the, the research question was, is there any society that actually plays like the, the predictions of the, uh, of the Homo economicus? So they went to these 15 most case societies far away from Relation, cultural relations with, uh, with the, the westernized uh, world. And, and, uh, and here you see evidence from there. So, so this Papua uh, PNG study, uh, Paraguay, Paraguay, 
I think also this one, are all coming from that study, Tanzania. Tanzania. So you see here, so this is the, the average of the offer. You see? 39, 40, 45. So it's the average is all no uh, smaller than 40, okay? So this is the average. That means that you are averaging the many people who offered 50 with the few people that offered also like 10 or 15, okay? So basically, it seems like this behavior is, is culturally independent. So, or at least every, uh, everybody understand that this is uh, the behavior um, uh, that other players uh, will, uh, uh, will do. And, and, and in fact, uh, players anticipating that make very large offers. And uh, so this is uh, robust uh, to cultural differences and it is robust to a number of other of other um, um, uh, checks or uh, modifications of the game that have been tried. For instance, uh, in the beginning there were doubts whether people really understand the game, whether they understand uh, the implications. So uh, there was a lot of variations in being sure, oh, sorry, a lot of um, initial um, treatment variations that try to uh, induce a better understanding of the game or through repeated uh, games and so on and so forth. So one of the, uh, the, the one that is mentioned here, so somebody was questioning, well, you obtain this behavior because you are actually playing with uh, peanuts, okay, with, I mean, small amounts, but what would happen if people really play with high stakes? So they went, uh, some experimentalists went to developing societies where they could offer uh, relatively high stakes as compared to the purchasing power of those people. Like when I, I mean relatively high stakes, I mean uh, stakes that correspond to one week or even one month worth of local salary, okay? So a, a very high stake. So suppose that you play this game today here with 2,000 euros instead of 10 euros, okay? That, does it change behavior? Well, actually, no. I mean, not the substance of it. You, you see a, a little decrease in the average offer, but the substance of this behavior is still there. All right, so, um, so we have learned from this, um, this game that people have a strong feeling for reciprocity and they have uh, very uh, averse to inequity. So let me spend a few words on uh, what are, so this, this time we are living in, this time of the COVID, is, is um, uh, well, has prompted many of us, many, many experimentalists, to study the robustness of the social preferences to these challenging times. So what happens to social preferences in times of crisis? So there were some evidence scattered in previous studies here and there, but then but by now there are literally hundreds of colleagues, experimentalists around the world who are running studies, studying exactly how social preferences have been modified because of the uh, COVID uh, crisis. Uh, so we knew already that social preferences could be affected by the crisis. Okay, but how does this specific crisis is affecting uh, social preferences? So here, I. Um, so wh why, why first? Let's let's. Why is it interesting to try to answer this study? Well, of course, there is a direct consequentialist implication of making this study. I mean, as a as a policy advice, so our job as economists is not only to understand human behavior, but to use this understanding to, for instance, to improve public policies, okay? So think about very practically. So last year, the, the main uh, uh, 
the main question mark about public policy was how how do people react when you uh, uh, when you introduce lockdowns when you uh, mandate people to stay at home so well, when you limit freedom of movement and this year uh, main public policy question mark concerns of course what what does it change when you <laughs> or at least what do you have to do to uh, maximize the vaccination rate okay is, is it better to go with uh, mandatory vaccination is the green pass so this kind of incentives based on norm i mean the green pass actually preserves freedom in a sense you're always free not to vaccinate but of course offers uh, incentives in terms of um, in terms of non-monetary incentives okay uh, or it is better only to go after higher vaccination rates with other means improving understanding culture whatever okay so these kind of uh, policy implications uh, of course uh, you you immediately understand that they have much to do to do with social preferences okay so the way people uh, feel about others the way people uh, mm, uh, become compassionate about the situations of others and so on and so forth change uh, may uh, interact with the uh, with, uh, with their decision on how to uh, follow uh, the policy prescriptions you are going to introduce. Uh, and of course, there is a general interest also in understanding what comes next, okay? So will the world after the pandemic be uh, a better world, as somebody claimed, with uh, people uh, being more altruistic and more sympathetic, or will be a nastier place with people, you know, feeling detached uh, even further. Okay, so this is, of course, also uh, something that, uh, that, 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 that a lot of people are asking them, uh, themselves about, and a, a social scientists are trying to answer by using these experiments to see how social preferences are changing or what drives changes in this behavior. So you all remember last year on Easter, no, like it was one week before Easter, I believe, Pope Francis um, arguing that we are all in the same boat. So there were at that time, early on expectations that this pandemic through which we all went on would have made people more, um, yeah, would have, uh, yeah, more sympathetic, more, more inequity averse, to use the words of uh, social premises, more positively reciprocating towards others' behavior, and so on and so forth. There were these kind of expectations, okay? They were all over the places. Actually, concerning this statement, Luigino Bruni is, uh, is used to say that, in fact, this, this is not a precise statement. He argues that, in fact, we are all in the same uh, storm, but we are with very different boats. There are somebody with very comfortable boats and some others with very shaky boats, which I believe it's probably more, uh, more of a truthful uh, description. All right, so, um, so um, as I told you, there, were, there are colleagues, experimentalists, that have been running these experiments just before and during the pandemic. So here is a study from China. Actually, this is exactly from Huan, where the pandemic started. And they, by chance, basically, this, these guys were running an, an ultimatum game for other purposes just a few weeks before everything began. And then they started to say, okay, so we have the data, which is just, you know, from a few weeks ago with nothing happened. Let's replicate this game again during the pandemic. So these waves are basically between, uh, 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 this is between the last, uh, late uh, December through uh, May, okay? 
and, and it is run in Juan. And here on the vertical axis, you see the modal, no, sorry, the, the mean uh, offer by the proposer, so the, by the green player. So you see here, 40% is again a confirmation that the results from the ultimatum game are very robust. That's, that's what you see everywhere, okay? So here you see that, uh, in fact, the mean, uh, the mean offer has fluctuated a little bit, but the tendency is to grow a little bit, okay? So it seems like here, uh, in fact, during the pandemic, at least in China, at least in one, during those short months, in fact, social preferences have been um, have been uh, um, pushed. Uh, so pushed is not a correct term, but at least, um, well, the, the, the mean offer in the ultimatum game, which means uh, whatever we discussed before in terms of reciprocity and in terms of inequity aversion, has moved up. Uh, so this was China. So what about other places? So here you have uh, an experiment run here in Rome by colleagues from Lewis, um, in which basically what you see here on this graph is, is the average mean, but now just pay attention, you have to read it in reverse. So when you, when you read six, uh, it means that this, this player is keeping six for himself. So it is, in fact, he's just offering four, okay? So five uh, is what you, uh, yeah, 5.4, that means that he's offering on average 4.6, okay? And here, wh why there are two, uh, two uh, different columns here? Uh, basically, because the, so this experiment, they, they were not as fortunate as the Chinese colleague and they, they didn't run uh, a session of the experiment just before to confront it with what happened uh, after. They only ran a session in April 2020 in Italy, so right in the middle of the, or at least when, yeah, when, when you know, there were still uh, several hundred deaths per day, so it was very uh, tough situation. And here they could distinguish between those who were for more than six weeks locked down from those who had a lesser uh, extension of the lockdown. The lockdown was differentiated uh, uh, regionally, was differentiated also by the fact that you, you could have been sick and, uh, or, already, so you were supposed to stay at home before. So here you are differentiating, uh, so you're looking at different experiences through the lockdown. So those who stayed locked down for a longer period, in fact, they tend to offer less. So it seems like the experience of a uh, very elongated lockdown, so very, very tough also in terms of, um, yeah, uh, basically induces those people to offer less. So some, somehow affected neg negatively their uh, social preferences. And here you see instead the same data, but distinguished by the number of people who you were leaving the lockdown with, okay? So suppose that you could have been locked down alone or you could have been locked down in your family. So having one, two or more people around you induces a, a more a, a fairer offers. So it seems like the experience of the lockdown, if it is mediated by staying in the family, has a much more positive impact on your social preferences. Or put it uh, in other ways, uh, suffering the lockdown alone was very detrimental to the social preferences, or much more so than actually spending that time with, with a family, typically. And, and here you see the same, uh, the same, uh, the same thing uh, by distinguishing between. Uh, so uh, think that the, the, this pool of uh, responders are mostly university students. So there were a lot of students that were basically uh, staying in Rome alone, uh, very far away from their 
households. And, 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 and instead, there were those who could be here and staying with the families. Well, again, you see something similar to the previous uh, thing. So those who were far away from family typically had uh, a, a much um, um, yeah, worse impact on their social preferences. So basically, there, this is, uh, th there is a similar, more complex, but similar in the findings study from England, which basically confirms uh, the same situation. So uh, actually, the experience uh, of the lockdown, if it was mediated by the family, was much, um, much uh, less uh, detrimental to social preferences. All right, so, um, so there are uh, many studies of this kind go going on, so I cannot present uh, further evidence here because of time constraints, but also because uh, these studies are also in the, still in the process of uh, being elaborated and, uh, and data collected. Uh, but uh, I hope I offered you um, um, uh, a very um, brief but hopefully interesting introduction about uh, what we do to study in economics, to study issues that seems or seemed far away from economics such as fraternity and um, and, uh, and in particular, uh, that, I mean, nowadays, uh, these topics are becoming very relevant to economics as a social science, but also to e the economy, okay? I just, uh, last week I was, uh, I was in Gubbio for, um, at the LUMSA, we, we have actually a, a building in Gubbio, but we, we were there with the economy of Francesco, so this is a, large movement that answered uh, to the Pope call for a different economy that was launched uh, two, two, uh, two and a half years ago. And so last week we were there for a summer school that uh, actually the topic of the school was we the common, okay? So the, the idea is that uh, the, the pressing issues of, uh, of, uh, of economics and the economy to do it today is on how you manage the common goods. And this was the topic of the, of the school. So you see that these uh, themes uh, are becoming uh, uh, ever, every, uh, every time more relevant to uh, the, the real economy as well. Uh, so concerning uh, how fraternity has been challenged by the, the, the pandemic, well, those who were uh, uh, thinking or were wishing that we would have become more fraternal and more, um, yeah, more, uh, more fraternal because of the pandemic probably have been deluded after one year uh, because actually, as, as we, I tried to show you briefly, the, the, the impact is more complex. So in general, the, the pandemic has been impacting people in very asymmetric ways, and, uh, and, uh, and this is what is emerging from this uh, data analysis. So th that, that um, yeah, probably for some that was true, that we became more fraternal, but some others, those who especially suffered a lot from from the consequences of the pandemic that is uh, up to be studied yet. All right, thank you very much. And um, so we have, we can conclude the, the... Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matteo, for this interesting presentation about uh, our social preferences uh, after COVID-19 on how COVID-19 has changed uh, social preferences about a fraternity understood as uh, something like my destinies are linked to others' destinies and uh, about the, the outcomes, the, the positive outcomes of the, 
of fraternity for economics and for society. We have now time for discussion. Uh, so feel free uh, from home to, to